Hello, welcome to our second National Geographic session of this 24-hour global event. We're so happy to have you here. Um, it's bright and early on the West Coast here in Seattle um, at 5, 5 a.m. and more in the evening for my colleagues who are joining us here today. So I'm really excited to get into this second um, National Geographic session and are really glad that you're with us today. So my name is Marissa Narunjan. I am the Deputy Director here at the Snow Leopard Trust and I am joined today by my wonderful colleague um, Kulu Suryawanchi, um, and he is the director of our high altitude program, along with pra Prasenji Yadav, who is a molecular biologist, biologist turned photographer, um, and whose breathtaking photos have been featured in the Everest National Geographic issue, which came out in July. Um, and again, I know I mentioned this before, and you'll, you'll hear some people talking about about it through this event, but if you click on the speaker button on the left hand side of your screen, you can read all of the wonderful biographies and a little bit more about each of our speakers. So I highly encourage you to do that. There's some fun get to know you questions, like something you might not read in every bio. So please, please do that. Um, and I'm just so thrilled to be here with both of you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you for having, having us here. Um, again, so for over 100 years, National Geographic has been tra transporting us to far off lands and adventure, helping us develop a deep appreci appreciation of our natural world, page after captivating page. In this recent Everest issue, National Geographic takes readers to the roof of the world, where the air is thin and the ghosts of the mountain can be seen disappearing just over the ridgeline. I want us to huddle here today over this virtual wood burning stove, I can almost feel it, um, clasp our hands around a steaming cup of chai, whatever beverage you may be sipping on, depending on what hour it is, and really let's go back kind of to the roots of where this all began. Um, so Prasenjit, I know we did a live chat a few months ago, or I guess it was a few, yes, a few months ago now, time is <laughs> whizzing by. Um, but where we sat down and talked a little bit about this issue. And I know Kuluji's name came up quite a bit. And um, there was just such a deep level of respect there that you can see in a really deep friendship. So I was wondering if you both could talk a little bit about how you first met, because I think it's through the roots of that friendship that this project came out, which we'll talk a little bit about um, later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Marisa, first of all. Thank you for having me here. And thank you to all the listeners, those who are tuning in right now. Uh, I'm right now in India and we are from different places uh, speaking to you. Uh, but yeah, this entire, for me, uh, the entire story and all the genesis of the project and everything that I, I managed to do in the last couple of years on this project, it all goes back and, and, and roots to, to Kulu. And, uh, and I think it, I, I vaguely remember the first time I met Kulu. I, I was a research student. I was a molecular biologist in Dr. Rumar Ramakrishnan's lab back in 2010 or 11. And, and Kulu was doing his, his research with Uma as well. And I was sitting and, and someone walked into the room and everyone were like, oh, Kulu's here. There are new stories coming in and we should hear more about Himalaya. And I was like, Who's this guy? I mean, and, and, and to my luck, he came and sat next to me and, and we started talking. He told me he works on snow leopards and, and, and I was immediately in awe of him and, uh, and we became really good friends. He, he, he's more like a brother mentor and sorry, Kulu, I can see your face, but I have to say this. Uh, so, <laughs> so it started there and for years we knew about each other's work. We knew we were part of each other's uh, professional journeys, uh, but we never thought of working together. Uh, I have never said this probably online or to people, but I got to know about National Geographic and their grants program because of Kulu. Today, people know me as this National Geographic photographer, but I think it started with Kulu because he got that grant before. So yeah, six, seven years down the line, uh, one fine day we get an email from Geographic saying that we have this internal grant only for explorers to, to work together. And, and both me and Kulu, we knew that this is it. And uh, me, Kulu, uh, Munib and Justin, we sat together, Kulu and Munib thought of a project and 
and I became part of the storytelling angle of that project and we applied to geographic. We got funding and that project was initially about mountain goats and, and the snow leopard. It initiated in Kyrgyzstan, we spent some time in Mongolia and then we came to India. So I think that was the genesis of this entire story. Uh, yeah. Actually, you know, what's, what was interesting in Prasen's, uh, my friendship with Prasen was, uh, you know, like he mentioned, this was 10 years ago that he joined Uma's lab where I was a PhD student. <clears throat> I mean, my PhD was with NCF, but I was doing my molecular biology work in, uh, in Dr. Uma's lab. And Prasen was this young guy. He came from a small town in India. And, you know, I, I always have soft corner for people coming from small towns in India because I myself came from a sub small town in India. And we speak the same local language, Marathi. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing that he would do all his molecular work and then take his camera and step out in the campus and start taking pictures of all the small critters he would see. And believe it or not, I mean, for me, his first most impressive picture was that of a spider. Uh, the, the web had dew on it and the moon in the oh, background. Like it was, I mean, you know, that, that, that picture sort of took the, 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 the creepiness out of spiders, you know, which is what, what people are scared of and made it look beautiful. You know, you want it like hug the spider. And, you know, Prasen even won some awards for it. And, and then, you know, I, I could see him sort of start leaning from there onwards from molecular biology to photography. And I'm, I'm glad that I, I never had to collaborate with Prasen on a molecular biology project. That would have been a disaster, I think. But because we could work, you know, collaborate on a field project, that was uh, that was much much better, uh, and yeah, it's you know when, when things come out like this National Geographic issue and we have a story in it and all of that, it feels uh, it feels like it just happened. But this was like ten years in the making. You know, yeah. my first National Geographic grant was two thousand eleven, and you know it's been we've been adding to it slowly, adding to it. So this was like our fourth. I mean, my fourth project with National Geographic, uh, two of them in collaboration with Prasen. So it's, you know, it's been a grind uh, at some level, but I'm, I'm glad to have shared the journey with a good friend of mine. And, and like Prasen said, we're more like brothers now than, than friends, They're just friends. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And just thinking too, like if that day you had sat somewhere else, right? Or like you had not been in class that day or just, it's amazing to those like decisions that you make that have such a great impact on your life. And just that story of the spider, right? That like just a, catching like something in a different lens and shifting that perspective of something that people have such um, rooted, um, you know, different perceptions of and then transforming that through the beauty of photography. And I think that's what's also captured so beautifully in this issue and giving people that insight of just again, yeah, these pages, we look at it and marvel at it, but like really what's behind these pages, right? <laughs> like you said, it's years and years and years of freezing cold temperatures and building relationships and cultivating story um, that continues, right? Like this is just kind of one chapter in it and, and we go on from there. That's amazing. Um, and Kulu, you had mentioned that you're also from a small town in India and, you, and also talked a little bit about how Kibber, which, um, you know, is, is part of this article is really almost like a second home to you Again, was wondering if you could kind of give us an insight into that landscape and that second home. Yeah, so, you know, I, I grew up in a small village. Uh, my, my ancestral village is, it ha it's got like 70 houses. It's close to a UNESCO World Heritage Site and there's lots of very good forest around it, but it's in the hot plains of India. You know, summer temperatures easily go beyond 40 degrees Celsius and that's, that's the routine for us. Um, but then I was always interested in rock climbing and mountains. And you know, that, that's a whole another story of how it's actually through mountaineering that I entered the field of conservation. But when I started, I was still a college student when I saw a newspaper uh, a newspaper article about uh, you know young conservationist from India wins the Green Oscar, and that was actually Charu. Uh, mm -hmm. I was still a university student doing my undergraduate, and I was in awe of this person, you know, who works up in the snow leopard, uh, up in the mountains on snow leopards. And and I forgot about it. 
but then i joined the masters course and you know when you when you start a degree in ecology or conservation everybody start you know the, the first question people are going to ask you is so what do you want to work on and i would keep saying something on the mountains something on the mountains and there's this good friend of mine who who knew charu very well and he said hey if you want to work on the mountains i know just the right guy to introduce you to so i said who and he says charu mishra and i was like hey that's the guy who won the green oscar <laughs> 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 so but to cut a long story short i started working with charu and uh, my first field work you know i mean i was thrown in the deep end my first field work was 6 months of winter in kibar uh, to to look at the blue sheep and my my field site was i mean my my camp was a little higher up from kibar in a tiny hamlet with just five or six houses uh, three of them were empty so there were just three houses there and i could walk from there to kibar and you know kibar is where i had all the friends you know which is where the it's the largest village in the neighborhood but it's just a, just the same size as my own village uh, back in maharashtra and you know so i would hang out there whenever i had the time you know in in the in the deep snow we would play cricket at at like 17000 feet up up in the mountains and eventually what happened was it became like a second home because you know every time i wanted to recover from extreme field work or isolation or any of that i would go back to kibar mm. so kibar became this this cozy cuddly comfortable place for me to come back drop my guard uh, you know just feel loved um, kibar is a village you know it's it's if you if you're walking on the streets you know every person who sees you is going to invite you uh, you know home for a cup of chai and you know in that minus 20 degrees how do you not say no to that <laughs> and so it just has this very warm vibe you know you you sort of going from one person's house to another person's house and you know you have these endless conversations over chai and there's nothing else to do uh, especially when those big winter blizzards come some of them last weeks and you just hold in with with you know five ten other people having endless cups of chai and and that's also i that that's that shaped my research and conservation outlook a lot because i got to see people's perspective up close i got to see what what a family goes through when there's a blizzard outside and they're trying to look after their livestock mm. uh, and and they know that you know when the blizzard goes and the livestock goes back out the livestock is at risk from snow leopards and so i you know mm. i had that uh, it, it wasn't like me the biologist living in a fancy research station uh, studying snow leopards it was me this little kid from a small village in india living in another small village uh, you know i have i have like 70 goats in my village i have you know 20 cows and i lose livestock to leopards sometimes yeah and so you know i i could i could seamlessly you know just dissolve in kibar and that way kibar just became second home over the years i've spent probably more time in kibar than i've spent in my own village because it's it's last 10 years i've, I've continuously worked there yeah so it just it just became a home i love that you also describe and prasenji describes it this way as well this warm and cozy and like such a very cold place anytime you're like negative 20 but still say warm and cozy is a testament i think to the people and that community um which is just it's so like such a beautiful um thought to have that welcoming warmness um and i know um prasen you have braved very cold temperatures in kibber as well um to take some incredible pictures um and i was wondering if maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that process of setting up those remote cameras and you know sleeping on the ice shelf waiting for that perfect shot <laughs> um and waiting for the next cup of chai after that yeah i i i have to say that i i totally resonate with kulu as well uh, about what he said about that village it's it's so warm although it is minus 40 degrees and minus mm-hmm. 50 degrees it's still warm uh and i disagree a little bit about the chai because after a point uh it got a little <laughs> too much to me my body was like no more cup of tea will kill you so <laughs> so i i i resorted to hot water but then it became really tricky to convince people that i my body is not accepting more chai uh so yes. i went on to the age old uh technique of answering and scaring them with gods i was like no 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 gods have said no tea 
Okay, okay. <laughs> so they were really, okay, okay. They're serious. This is this is not this is not some local doctor telling you not to have tea. The 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 uh, God. <laughs> the decision has come all the way from the top, uh, <laughs> and I survived with, with hot water. But uh, yeah, photography in snow leopards was definitely a dream, but a dream that I knew might never materialize. Like even in my wildest dreams, I never dreamt of doing something like this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so it was a big big deal, and 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 I think. I was I was totally blessed and I was lucky that I was working with this really solid team who had so much more information and knowledge about snow leopards. So when I went there, I had no clue about snow leopards. I had no clue about camera trapping and remote camera trapping in those high mountain areas. And most importantly, I had no clue about how to survive in that landscape, in that cold, in that harsh landscape. So, uh, so I would say... Uh, Taking photos of snow leopards is not only about snow leopards. It's a mixture of so many more things. It's, it's, it's pure uh, mountain adventure. It is uh, hardcore natural history and, and ecology. And, and the last thing is it, is, it is a testament to human endurance, like both physically as well as emotionally, because you spend such long times in isolation away from the world. So it was a mix of all of that. And, and I was trying to maneuver around them but to the viewers, those who don't know, we use this technique called as remote camera trapping to take really cozy and, and intimate pictures of snow leopards because uh, how much ever you move around there, you usually see them really far away, but we wanted those images which can tell the story. So we started setting up these studios high up in the mountains. Uh, you can imagine them as these selfie booths where the snow leopard would come and take a selfie and move on. Some of those snow leopard uh, developed a liking for my camera traps and that became a problem because they came and chewed the wires and they broke the glass and they peed on the cameras. I mean, I can go on and on about it, but, <laughs> but the process was to set them up in these cold environments and make sure that the technology works for, uh, for months and months and months. And, and as the law goes, everything would work, but something or the other won't. So, so it was a process uh, and, and slowly after months and months and months of work, we started getting pictures that I remember like, like my, uh, my first thing was to make sure I get some pictures that will make Kulu say that, wow, this is brilliant. Hmm. Uh, but that was like the baseline because, <laughs> because I think uh, researchers uh, think everything I do is, is cool. But uh, but I have an editor sitting in Geographic and she's like, huh, good start. Uh, show me something that, that I've not seen before. So, so I, was, I was in this weird space where, where at some point I, I was like, no, I, I should not rely on, on, on what Kulu thinks about my photos because he loves everything. <laughs> I need to caution myself. This is, where, this is where I need to say something. See, because for me as, as somebody who brought this expedition together, I had another challenge to deal with. I didn't want, I know Prasen is often very hard on himself. Mm -hmm. And I also had to make sure that he's out there alone, dealing with all these challenges. And if he only receives criticism, that can take a huge mental toll and, and that can break a person down. I've spent months uh, alone in the mountains and I know what mm -hmm. burden it places mentally. I used to worry, you know, okay, when I go back from here with my data, what if my data is not accepted by people? What will happen? And, and that was a huge pressure. So at, at some level, you know, uh, the thing is by now I knew Prasade enough and I knew expectations of National Geographic, but my job was not to wet those photographs. My job was to ensure that mm. this guy stays motivated and does his best because I knew if Prasade does his best, that's going to you know, that's going to cut through all filters. Mm, but love that. for him to be able to do his best, his motivation levels have to be high. And, you know, so a lot of what I would say was not actually feedback on his pictures. <laughs> but it was just, you know, trying to keep, keep him motivated. And, motivated and <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah, it, it, I think as a, you know, and then that's where my experience as a mountaineer goes back, which is yeah. part of working in the mountains is not just about, 
you know, the outcome. It's also about your team and it's also about keeping the motivation of the team together. Uh, you know, because four months in that cold, this is not like, you know, there's no central heating. There's, there's none of that. You come back from a day's work and then you start chopping wood, uh, you know, and then you get fire at the end of two hours of doing that. So it's, you know, it, it starts adding up four months of failure. And then you're like, what am I even doing here? Uh, so yeah, Prasen, I mean, you know, it was, no, I, I, I really appreciate that as well, because I, I could see that, uh, and, and we had those long conversations at times. I used to walk like four or five hours in, in snow to make one phone call to Kulu and, and, and he would tell his stories about, uh, about his time. And, and I think that all motivation is what was the crux of this entire story, because, uh, to be very honest, even in geographic, there are very few photographers do this kind of storytelling in today's day and age. Today's day and age is of helicopter storytelling. It's, it's more than, it's, it's fast. Everyone wants to get things fast. The budgets have gone down and everything is so fast uh, that this kind of long-term slow storytelling is, 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 is unheard of. And it's also because of many reasons. So I think keeping those motivation levels in, in right check was, was very important. And I think Kulu was doing that, but, uh, but to, uh, to break the impression, I was still very hard on myself <laughs> and it did get onto you after a point. Uh, and it worked out because at some point we started getting images and I started hearing from, from Kulu and Charity that, Oh, this is different. This is unique. This is, and and they also started seeing value because I remember Kulu seeing this image and be like, you know what the mountain you see in the background, that is such a typical Himalayan thing. And 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 I think it just started getting more organic after that. Uh, that they also got into this 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 entire space of no. Uh, there is a photo of a snow leopard and there is the photo of snow leopard which 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 is kind of a habitat and everything and 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 that started happening and i think beyond just the photo of snow leopards a lot of our entire story was around snow leopards it you know taking beautiful photos of snow leopards has been done before even by geographic 15 years ago by another colleague of ours uh steve winter he he probably has one of one of the best ever photos of snow leopards out there but that pretty picture of the sea leaves you species story is done, was done. And we knew that we have to build onto it and bring it to a next level where it's not about just beautiful photos of snow leopards, but a story of this, this species and how it survives in this truly harsh environment. And, and we think of it as harsh, but for snow leopards, it's just home. Mm. Uh, the issues that surrounds around this, the pictures had to bring out the larger layers of Snow leopard, people, mountain goats, domestic goats, and the relationship and the link between all three of all four of them, and 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 I think that story started uh, materializing. Yeah, and I think you touched you both sort of touched. I mean, a just talking about sort of the like evolution of this project, like over the course of this decade plus, right? And then also like this idea of people want fast and content and won't even read more than three sentences, right? And like things just need to come quickly. And um, snow leopards, studying snow leopards is the antithesis of that, right? That is like the complete opposite. You have to be in it for the long game. You have to like you know build it sort of brick by brick. Um, to get to like these answers, even about the species itself, right? That we are, um, we know so much more now through all of these things, like the remote, um, you know, cameras and other um, advancements of science and through our community work, but it's still like, we still have a long way to go. And that's what we're here sort of celebrating today in this collective event is all of these pieces and how they come together. And, you know, the Snow Leopard Trust is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary. So 40 years, four decades of doing this work and, um, and still having, you know, four decades plus to go. Um, and that's both, I think, heartening that we're in it and people understand that. And um, we're going to, you know, just continue on this path and realizing that it's a journey, so you, right? <laughs> you mentioned a very important point, Marissa, which is, uh, you know, we, we all have to stand on the shoulders of giants to be able to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think uh, any of 
even though it took us 10 years you know that wouldn't have been possible without charu's 15 years before that exactly uh, you know we we and 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 that's very evident in the story that that peter writes in national geographic mm-hmm. you know it, because it's not something that began 10 15 years ago it's something that began 25 years ago yeah uh, when snoda podcast first started working in this landscape and it is only through years of continuous support continuous presence do we know what we know today yeah and you know it's because of that and and i think you know when when it comes to species like the snow leopards and mountains like the himalayas these are not places where you know a fresh group of people can go do something in a few weeks and come back you know these are places where you know everybody has to sort of stay invested decades on decades to be able yes. to produce those results that they able to uh, produce and that that's not just a, you know about photographs or science but that's true for conservation as well you know these are not, you know it, it's not like i cannot nobody can just go there for 3 months and do a conservation project because 3 months you, you you you're going to need 3 months just to figure out how to stay warm you know <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and and speaking on to that i i remember uh being there uh that charu first spent two years just living there trying to just understand the community two years two years is a long time even before he initiated doing anything in that landscape so so i totally agree with pulu as he said that we are standing on tree giants and 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 the most yes. important thing that i i know and i were i spoke with peter at some point me peter charu pulu we were having a conversation and peter asked charu when when did he see his first snow leopard and and he was like i saw it much later after working for years in that landscape and i looked at peter and i was like you saw yours in the first 6 hours of getting into the <laughs> in the yeah. village and that is because of these 25 years of work done by the snow leopard trust and ncf and the villagers and the community that today we get to see uh, these species at such a faster easier and and i wouldn't say cozier but but easier way yeah. i mean there's there's one more thing to it though you know the seeing snow leopards has become fairly predictable now and you have lots of people with very fancy gear and you know one of the reasons why i think uh, we were able to do a story at at national geographic level was again that combination with prasen and uh, you know and our team where it wasn't about the the pretty picture of a snow leopard mm-hmm. you know we wanted to do a story which was about science a story which was about conservation and that is where we needed a person who could who could take pictures of snow leopards with with these flavors uh, you know yeah. mixed in in that and that's very stat very difficult to do in a static frame you know you can do a movie about it where you have some shots of people and some shots of but in you know and and i knew that if anybody could do it it's it's prasen you know because i'd seen years of his work you know just that that spider image that i mentioned mm-hmm. earlier i could see that he could really turn the picture around you know he could yeah. you know he could just and 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 prasen i spent hours i mean several days you know we would meet every evening for several hours at a time to think of okay you know what how do we bring these two things together another challenge is it's an open landscape you know it's very hard to create nice frames in this vast open landscape every every picture you know if if you see every picture of snow leopard looks like another picture of snow leopard and that is because the landscape doesn't change you yeah. know the background doesn't change and so that that's sort of an added layer of challenge as to how do you come up with an image that stands you know above the rest and i knew that that you know prasen had that eye for you know that eye who could tell 25 years of our journey yeah you know with with most other photographers it would have been more about today it would have been more about what it is like now but you know if you go through that that article uh, and, and those images it actually demonstrates that 25 years of journey absolutely uh, and, and you know that that was really the hard challenge and again you know i i bring that back to 40 years of snow leopard trust and you know 25 years of the the india program 
uh, it's 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 that is that is what made this possible um, you know otherwise we i i remember prasen and i are our biggest fear always was that you know it will end up being the static story about sonapur tourism today you know that yeah. that used to be our biggest fear and and lucky i mean and and then of course several things came together prasen really hit it off with peter you know and when i got introduced to peter i was like okay we found the right writer and yeah. you know so all of that had to also come together and and all the hard work was done by prasen i mean i was there for ideas but to really pull this together it it was uh, prasen and his his unique uh, perspective on on wildlife photography yeah Thank absolutely you. Thank you. Uh, uh but yeah uh, just to add to that i think i think one thing that was very clear in our mind uh through our initial conversations that uh we don't want to make this uh only about what it is today and the uh, idea that i went into the mountains and that i still think is the crux of uh, that story was to we know snow leopards as this really magical elusive and to some extent even a mythical kind of a aura around it a, a creature like that and we we think of it as nothing can happen to it but the idea was to look at snow leopard from the eye of or bring it down to the level of of any other big cats in the world maybe tiger leopard snow uh, mm-hmm. a lion and jaguar and be like snow leopards although elusive it is facing more or less the same issues like any of these big cats but the other issue is and the bigger issue is that we know so much more about these four big cats and compared to them we know so little about snow leopard so i think putting this this kind of puts uh, the story into a perspective that so much more has to be done we know more about snow leopards than we knew about 10 years ago but compared to other big cats we know so little about it and that's the reason why i think uh, that species need even more attention than it, it it is getting right now yeah absolutely and you also i know one thing this is a little bit of a spoiler alert but so our kind of speaking of that 40th anniversary our um 2021 calendar that's coming out our wall calendar is going to feature all of preston jeet's image and really uh, images and tell this kind of narrative as we've talked about today and i think it's so great because it spans all of our different programs and um we can celebrate that every month of the year in 2021 which we're really looking forward to a new year and um kind of kicking off that 40th anniversary anniversary and when we were picking the images right we got to kind of go through and we got a little glimpse into Prasenjit's um uh, gallery right like sharing his screen and just i wanted to see more I'm like no 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 like let me just see the one on the left you know like keep going <laughs> and we just were like trying to decide between two images and like you said when you see this like gorgeous snow leopard but then you zoom out just a little bit and you see like the village below and just a little bit and like the lights are on and like just a little bit more and you really get this beautiful layered story it's not just the cat right the cat is a piece of this overall comprehensive image um and it's all of those layers i think that make it so powerful and um and one thing too like i think new conservation groups kind of coming into the fold right like you can't just get that history you can't go back and and rebuild and so one thing i think that's really amazing um you know that we've all kind of been a part of and really you know starting with charu as well writing the partners principle and this um this this eight tenants that kind of go through how to to engage with community and how to build conservation programs and of course tailor it to what works best for each organization but really have this core framework that people can kind of learn from all of those different ways of really engaging with with community and with science and to build conservation networks and that can be sort of the gift that keeps on giving as well for other groups who are continuing to flourish and come in because it is such a like the trust is a really special place and with all of our local partners you know like NCF and SLCF and SLF um all of the SL <laughs> um different organizations that we work with in these you know five range countries that we partner in and there's just nothing else like it it's very hard to describe it to people and i always say um you know that my they say you need an elevator pitch right like if you're meeting a stakeholder or somebody like you know 2 minutes that describes what you do and i just say it's impossible we need a 14000 story building that goes up and down 10 times and then sure that's the elevator <laughs> i could <laughs> could encapsulate it in that amount of time but it is it's just layer upon layer of really authentic um relationship building um 
and what comes out of that are these um, you know, partnerships and these images that are representative of those partnerships really um, to even be able to be there in the first place, right, and witness that. So um, I really do thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm so glad that, that this project was born out of this day in a lab, just to happen to <laughs> see each other and make this really um, incredible story that continues to tell itself. No, but, but I'm a scientist now. I don't buy that story. I'm going to say that. Pro probabilistically speaking, would have definitely met you working in the same institution. So another day, there, there would have been a day when you learned that. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. The statistics, I love it. That's amazing. That's incredible. Um, well, I think that actually brings us to the end of our session. I want to keep chatting with you guys, and I think we actually will have the opportunity to do that because we are about to go live um, to answer some questions from our wonderful supporters who are listening and um, might want to dig a little bit deeper into some of what we talked about today or ask something new. So we're really excited to do that. Um, I will mention again, as I said, that the calendar is for sale. Um, it's gorgeous. I've already like pre-ordered 20 copies. It's going to be the only thing I give to people this year um, to really celebrate this time capsule. I mean, all of this feels like such a gorgeous um, testament to history, and the calendar is no different. So please treat yourself to that. Um, this is, you're the first people to get to buy it, so it's really exciting. Um, and again, thank you for joining us here today. Together, we are truly mighty, and I look forward to continuing this journey with all of our attendees and, and with you both as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank, Thank you. you. And on to the live. <laughs> See you guys soon.